In NBA history, there are players, and then, there are legends. Among these legends, one particular name stands tall and casts a shadow over any player who has ever picked up a basketball. His name is synonymous with dominance, with excellence, and with the very spirit of competition. I'm talking about William Felton Russell, or just Bill. The man who won 11 championships. So, what would happen if Bill Russell never even existed? Before we start, I just want to say that this video was heavily inspired by a Johnny Arnett video. Arnett was the guy who actually inspired me the most and made me want to do YouTube, so definitely check him out. I should also mention that this video is just meant to be a bit of fun. Realistically, if Bill Russell never even exists, then the NBA as we know it would be completely different. I'll get more specific later. But for now, just know that I'm simply going to remove Russell from our timeline, so I won't be speculating that, say, Oscar Robertson becomes a Celtic. No, for now I'm just going to look at the championships, the accolades, and some of the records that Bill Russell has, and determine who would be the new winners if he no longer exists. First, let's look at who wins Russell's five MVP awards. For this part, I'm just going to look at who was the runner-up in MVP voting each year Russell won the award. I'm not going to be making personal decisions on who I think should have won each year. The 1958 MVP now goes to Dolph Shays. Some early NBA stars saw noticeable dips in their production after the implementation of the shot clock in 1954, but Shays was not one of them. In fact, he only seemed to improve once the league added the shot clock. Statistically speaking, 1958 was the best season of Shays' career as he put up a career-best 24.9 points, 14.2 rebounds, 3.1 assists, and a league-leading 90.4% from the free-throw line. This was also the season where Shays topped George Mikan's record for the most all-time points in organized basketball, which he did in a game against the Pistons on January 12th. The 1961 MVP now goes to Bob Pettit. Big Blue averaged 27.9 points, a career-best 20.3 rebounds, and 3.4 assists, making him the second player in NBA history to ever eclipse the 20 points and 20 rebounds average for an entire season. The Hawks also finished with a 51-28 record, the best of Pettit's entire career, and second best in the league, only trailing the Celtics. The 1962 MVP now goes to Wilt Chamberlain. I'll make this one brief, because this is probably the most controversial MVP award in NBA history, but now that Russell is out of the picture, Wilt can finally call the MVP his own, with 50.4 points, 25.7 rebounds, and 2.4 assists. The 1963 MVP now goes to Elgin Baylor. After missing half of 1962 due to military service, Baylor got right back to business the following season, as he averaged 34 points, 14.3 rebounds, and 4.8 assists. After starting the 62-63 season with a 43-13 record, Jerry West missed the final seven weeks due to a hamstring injury. Without him, the Lakers went 10-14. They still finished with a great 53-27 record, but I have a feeling the final seven weeks ended up hurting Baylor's MVP case. Finally, the 1965 MVP goes to Oscar Robertson. The Big O put up a monster stat line of 30.4 points, a league-leading 11.5 assists, and 9 rebounds. On December 18th, he scored a career-high 56 points against the Lakers, and throughout the season, he led all players in win shares and minutes played. And just for fun, we'll select a new 1963 All-Star Game MVP. Russell won the award for putting up 19 points and 24 rebounds. Now, the 1963 All-Star Game MVP goes to Oscar Robertson, who put up 24 points, 6 assists, and 3 rebounds on 60% shooting. How about the rebounding titles? Over the course of his career, Russell won 4 of them in 1958, 59, 64, and 65. Technically, he led the league in 1957, but he only played in 48 games, so I'm not really going to count that one. The new 1958 rebounding champion is Maurice Stokes, in what would be the final season of his career before his paralyzing injury. Stokes is a name that's often lost to time, because he only played for three seasons in the 50s, but man did he showcase a ton of talent in that short window. He was a three-time All-Star, he made three All-NBA teams, Rookie of the Year, and from 56 to 58, he led all players in total rebounds. The new 1959 rebounding champion is Bob Pettit, who averaged 16.4 per game. 
and Wilt Chamberlain ends up winning the new 1964 and 65 rebounding titles. Now, we're gonna look at a few of Bill Russell's records and determine who the new winners are in this alternate universe. First, and probably the most obvious, Bill Russell holds the record for most NBA championships as a player, with 11. As you'll see with a few of these records, the players in second or third place are usually Russell's teammates. In this case, Sam Jones now has the most NBA championships with 10. Four other Celtics players have 8, and two more have 7. But if Russell no longer exists, I'm not so sure those players would have racked up as many rings. If you want to know the player with the most amount of championships who didn't play for the Celtics in the 60s, Robert Horry now has the most, with 7. Next, Bill Russell holds the record for most Game 7 victories, going a perfect 10-0 over the course of his career. Now that he's out of the picture, his teammate Sam Jones now holds the record, with 9 Game 7 wins. But, same thing as last time. Assuming some of those wins might be erased now that Russell no longer exists, there are four non-60 Celtics players who are tied for the number one spot. Al Horford, Ray Allen, Robert Horry, and Dennis Johnson, who all won seven game sevens. Next, Bill Russell holds the record for most finals games played with 70. As expected, Russell's longtime teammate and friend Sam Jones is right behind him with 64. But excluding Jones, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar now holds the record, with a total of 56 finals games played, just nearly beating out LeBron James, who's played in 55. Next, Bill Russell holds the record for the most rebounds in a single quarter, when he grabbed 19 in the fourth quarter of Game 7 of the 1962 Finals, which is insane. Now, the new record holder is Nate Thurmond, who grabbed 18 rebounds in a quarter against the Baltimore Bullets on February 28, 1965. Next, Bill Russell holds the record for the most career defensive win shares, as well as the most defensive win shares in a single season. The second closest player in terms of career win shares is Tim Duncan, who is widely seen as one of the best defenders of all time. Remember, playing for a long time can really help add to a player's career win shares, but despite the fact that Tim Duncan played for six more seasons, Bill Russell still has a stranglehold on the record. <laughs> Insane. Just going by single seasons, it's also comical how much Russell dominates that category. Not only does he have the most defensive win shares in a season, but he also has the second most, and the third most, and fourth, and fifth, and sixth. Then, we finally reach the new record holder, which is Wilt Chamberlain's 1968 season. Now, we move on to the main event. We are going to find out if the Celtics still win 11 championships without Russell. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to re-simulate the 11 postseasons that resulted in a championship and simply remove Russell off of the Celtics roster each year. Some of you might question my rules and decisions with this part, and I understand completely if you do. Of course, if Bill Russell never exists, then that means the Celtics finish with different regular season records, they may not trade or even draft the same players they eventually get, and probably the biggest one is that running games through a computer simulation is by no means a flawless system. The results could very well change every single time, so I can't really say that anything is definite. But this isn't meant to be a super intense speculation video. This is just meant to be a fun exercise. For simplicity's sake, I'm not going to re-simulate the entire playoffs each season, just the East. So that means that the West teams who made the finals in real life are still going to make the finals for these simulations. Also, I'm not going to re-simulate 1958 or 67. I'll let the Hawks and Sixers keep their championships. So, here are the results I ended up getting. Even without Bill Russell in 1957, the Celtics still end up beating the Syracuse Nationals in the East Finals. And in the Finals, they still end up beating Bob Pettit and the St. Louis Hawks. I know it's just a simulation, but I've gotta say, Arnie Risen really impressed me with how he stepped up as the Celtics' new starting center. Some of you might not know who this guy is, but Risen is one of the most underrated players from the early days of the NBA. He's a Hall of Famer who had won a championship with the Rochester Royals in 1951, and despite being skinnier than a lot of centers at the time, he was very quick and used his agility as an advantage against the bigger guys. However, in 1959, the Syracuse Nationals get their revenge as they beat the Celtics in the East Finals, knocking them out of the playoffs, thanks to big performances from Dolph Shays and Red Kerr. 
The two continue to play very well, as they end up beating the Minneapolis Lakers in the finals, despite a valiant effort from a rookie Elgin Baylor. In 1960, the Celtics run into a rookie Wilt Chamberlain on the Philadelphia Warriors in the East Finals, but without Russell, the Warriors end up beating the Celtics and move on to the Finals against the St. Louis Hawks. The Warriors have a strong starting lineup, but in the end, the Hawks' superior depth leads to an easy victory, and the St. Louis Hawks become the new 1960 champions. In 1961, the Celtics face off against the Syracuse Nationals in the East Finals again, but a still-prime 32-year-old Dolph Shays once again has a great series, and with a little help from a young future Hall of Famer Hal Greer, the Nationals beat the Celtics and move on to face the St. Louis Hawks in the Finals. But for the second year in a row, the Hawks' good team depth leads to an easy victory over their opponent. Now, we enter the 1962 playoffs, and this is where things get messy. The Celtics had no backup center in 1962, they only had Bill Russell. So with no real options, I decided to put Satch Sanders at center, which seemed like the best idea to me, but the idea kind of falls apart when you consider that Sanders had to match up with Wilt Chamberlain in the 1962 East Finals. As you can probably tell, the Warriors won this series comfortably and moved on to the finals, where, for the first time in history, Wilt Chamberlain is facing off against Jerry West and Elgin Baylor in the NBA Finals. This was an absolutely insane series for me to simulate. Wilt ate very well against Jim Krebs on the Lakers. In fact, one of these games, Wilt scores 78 points and grabs 32 rebounds, but Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside refused to let the series slip away. After going down 2-0, the Lakers begin crawling their way back, and in a Game 7 finale, the Lakers end up winning the new 1962 championship. In 1963, the Celtics go up against Oscar Robertson and the Cincinnati Royals in the East Finals, and despite the fact that they don't have Jerry Lucas on the roster yet, the Royals absolutely dominate the Celtics, winning the series and making the finals. That means we're gonna get another awesome finals matchup we never got to see in real life. Oscar Robertson battles for the championship with Jerry West and Elgin Baylor. I gotta be honest, I was kinda betting on the Lakers to win this one, but to my surprise, the Royals won this series pretty easily. Oscar Robertson led the way of course, but Bob Boozer, Jack Twyman, and Wayne Embry all came up huge as well. Oscar Robertson finally brings a championship to Cincinnati, as the Royals are now the new 1963 champions. In 1964, the Celtics go up against the Cincinnati Royals in the East Finals again, and like last time, they get absolutely crushed. So that means that our new hypothetical 1964 Finals matchup is between Oscar Robertson and the Royals, and Wilt Chamberlain and the San Francisco Warriors. Despite going up against a frontcourt of Wilt Chamberlain and Nate Thurmond, a rookie Jerry Lucas holds his own quite well, but the real star is once again Oscar Robertson, who takes advantage of being matched up against the smaller Guy Rogers, and the Royals are able to win the new 1964 championship, back-to-back -back titles. In 1965, Wilt Chamberlain once again makes it to the finals after the Philadelphia 76ers sweep the Celtics in the East Finals. So unfortunately, Havlicek does not steal the ball in this universe. Be still my beating heart. In the finals, Chamberlain once again matches up against the Lakers. But it is worth noting that, in real life, Elgin Baylor missed the entire 1965 finals due to injury. Considering this is an alternate reality, it could be possible that Baylor stays healthy and plays in the finals. But, I decided to remove Baylor from my new simulation. Even without him, Jerry West is able to keep the Lakers in the series. It actually comes down to the wire, but in the end, the Sixers are able to pull ahead and they win the new 1965 championship. In 1966, the Royals defeat the Celtics in the East semifinals. They then move on to face the 76ers in the East Finals, and this time, Chamberlain is able to get his revenge against Oscar Robertson, as the Sixers defeat the Royals and move on to the NBA Finals, which is a rematch between the Lakers and Sixers. This final series also comes down to the wire, 
But in the end, Gail Goodrich, Rudy LaRusso, and Daryl Imhoff are the difference makers, and the Lakers win the new 1966 championship. In 1968, the Celtics' string of playoff failures continue as they lose in the East semifinals to the Detroit Pistons. The Pistons move on to the East finals and match up with the Philadelphia 76ers. In real life, Billy Cunningham missed the entire 1968 postseason due to injury. Like with Baylor, that injury may or may not happen in this different timeline. But if I removed Baylor, I think it's only fair I remove Cunningham as well. The two Daves on the Pistons, Bing and DeBusher, gave it their all. But the Sixers still crushed the Pistons in the East Finals, and to make their way back to the Finals, and also for the fourth time, against the Lakers. But Cunningham's presence is missed greatly by the Sixers, as the Lakers complete a gentleman's sweep on Philly to win the new 1968 championship. Considering Chamberlain goes to the Lakers next season, Chamberlain kinda becomes like Kevin Durant in this new reality. In 1969, the Celtics lose to the Philadelphia 76ers in the East semifinals. The Sixers and the newly re-energized New York Knicks meet up in the East finals. The Knicks end up emerging victorious, and move on to the NBA Finals. Instead of the Lakers and Knicks meeting for the first time in the 1970 Finals, now they're meeting in 1969, which is the new beginning to their early 70s rivalry. Though, it appears these Knicks need a little more time together, because the Lakers end up sweeping them and win the new 1969 championship. Wow, that was long, but pretty fun. So, according to my personalized simulations, without Bill Russell, how does NBA history change? Well, for one, the Celtics go from 11 championship rings to just one. Now, there's no way to prove that this would happen in real life, but you have to admit, Russell's team impact was beyond huge. We also lose the beginning of the Lakers-Celtics rivalry. And I'd love to ask you, which legend benefits the most if Bill Russell never plays in the NBA? Let me know in the comments, and I hope you have a good day. Take care.